Yeah. The, the book the book is called here it is. Let's see. So Wars Over Come Home, a father search for his son, two tour Marine veteran of the Iraq War. Wow. I'm showing it because you're a book designer. I'm and we right. argued for quite a while over the cover, but we right. ended up using this cover. Okay, well, um, Andrew was uh, went to Boys Latin School and right here in Baltimore. And then uh, he was a bit of a rebel in school, and he, he uh, graduated, and he went to Florida, and he was uh, had all kinds of odd jobs in Florida. And then the the Marines found out about him, and they soon they started stopping by his door all the time. And as soon as they could, they got him, and uh, so he joined the Marines, and he was very excited about it. In a nutshell, because it's a long longer story. He joined the Marines, and then it was only he was in Intel originally, and then some things happened, and he ended up uh, being more in the infantry and, and and being a water dog. When they went to Iraq, one of the most important things you could do is be in charge of all the water. So he trained in the Marines. He did he did really well. He uh, you know got got stripes and uh, rose up, and next thing we knew, he was going to Iraq. And the first time he went to Iraq, it, it was not good. They they were the Marines were fairly good, but in general, the whole military operation was not was not um, very organized. And he was in, for instance, he was in his encampment one time, and these little pickup trucks of the enemy would would drive up about 50, 60 miles an hour right outside the barbed wire, and the concertina wire, and launch grenades. And he saw them launch a grenade. And the grenade hit the uh, shower where his sergeant had just gone. And we could get into that later. He saw all kinds of tough uh. things on the um, on that on that first tour. Then the second tour, uh, the Marines and the military had, were more organized. And he had but still he had some uh, very tough experiences. He had some he was writing me back from the Marines and writing all of us. And he had some incredible times. Like I was teaching Middle Eastern or medieval history about the Middle East and about the nomads in the desert. And right in the middle of teaching this up at Harford Day School in, in Harford County, I get an email from Andrew. And he's, he, is, he is in this huge armored truck. And they are patrolling through the desert of Iraq. And they're going about eight miles an hour because they have a gigantic steamroller in front to blow up the IEDs if, they, if there are any. And he's up and he's the guy manning the, they call it Madus, this, this big double-barreled machine gun. And so in the distance, they see all this activity. And so his whole caravan, everyone gets ready and they get their fingers on the trigger and they're getting all ready for some action. And then he wrote me this beautiful email that's in the book. And he said, Dad, as we got closer and closer, it was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. It was one man bringing 400 camels across the desert. So then he, when he was in the Marines, and he, he did well when he was over in Iraq. When he came back, there was almost no decompression. Within He came back, he's in a firefight, and then four or five, five months later, he's released. So I want him to go to college and take advantage of the GI Bill, and he tried to do that. And he, he just said, Dad, I just can't sit in a classroom right now. It's, you know, I can't do it. And then after that, he wherever he went, he could always get a job really quickly. He had some good jobs in security. He had good jobs driving heavy equipment because he drove heavy equipment for the Marines in Iraq. But then he started getting more and more paranoid. And he'd call and he'd just be paranoid. And he was relying on, on marijuana a little bit more as, as something to ease the, the pain. And the paranoia picked up and he got a tick he got a tick and um, just got more and more nervous. And then he thought we were after him. He thought other people were after him. Mm. And he started not being able to work. He'd, be, he'd get a job and then, then he'd yell at someone or lose their temper. And so long story short, that took a few years after he was out of the Marines. Then he couldn't hold a job. And uh, we put him in the VA for about a few weeks. But he got in there and, and then... He did everything. The VA did a wonderful job analyzing him, trying to help him. The person he was the closest with was the Catholic chaplain there. They had psychiatrists, psychologists, sociologists, the chaplains. But then as he got better, he stopped taking the medication because he was hallucinating before he went there. He thought he saw us up on the roof. 
Mm -hmm. and, he, and he refused to recognize we knew who we were. He was like a different person. So he started getting a little better, started taking them, stopped taking the medication. One day he just packed up and left and never came back. Got a couple of jobs after that. And that brings us up until about four or five, four years ago where he's completely homeless now. And he's a homeless survivalist in New Mexico around the Albuquerque area. And he hikes sometimes 12, 13 miles a day. And he's one of the, oh, I just did a presentation on this and I have a picture of him getting up and going for a run in the morning. He's not doing that now, but for ages, he did all his Marine drills in the morning. The only homeless person I know that does that. Right. So he's very much on his own. He was always a family man, a family boy and loved being with the family. He was always the leader of a pack of guys. Six or seven guys were always with him. You know, he'd come in and have his arms all around him. And now it just makes us so sad because we've talked to a lot of homeless people and and a police officer, a retired police officer, once in a while sends us a, sends us a picture of him. And he just never talks to anyone. Mm -hmm. Although that is a safer mode because it's very dangerous being a homeless person, especially along the Rio Grande where he is. And homeless people are murdered there, murdered there intermittently. And it's a, it's a tough area. In the book, I have to say, the book, the book is not about just me. But I like the title, A Father's Search for His Son because most of it's from my perspective, but the book is really about the whole family search for this, for our son. And it um, is also about the conflict and the tensions that, that evolved that would come about because often we'd have to make a decision. Are we going to go to San Diego? If we find him, what are we going to do? And, you know, some of us are more aggressive than others and we'd have to debate and, and come up with a solution. So, but in general, we worked really, really well together and we became a, a very good team. We could go to a city and someone could identify a homeless person out of millions of people in, in Seattle or San Diego or Santa Fe. And within two or, th two or three days, we usually could locate that person, whether or not it was Andrew. Right. But it was a daunting task, as you can imagine, just flying into a city and starting to look.